You're listening to the QuickBook Reviews podcast. Brighten your day with a book. Hello, my fellow bookworms. This is Philippa from QuickBook Reviews. How are you all? Are you okay? Are we having one of those days? Yes, I think we are. We're having one of those days, weeks, months, years. Crikey. But fact for the day. If you're having trouble sleeping, I've got a solution. Uh, I currently have to sleep with a child who's ill, so uh, sleep is a problem, particularly when they've got their audio book on, which isn't exactly what I'd want to listen to to go to sleep. But I have practiced this quite a lot. So I just push this drawer in now. There you go. There's a noise. Um, Yeah, I practice it quite a lot and it does seem to work. So I'll share it with you. See what you think. So it's about (laughs) visualising. Honestly, bear with me on this. So when you're trying to get to sleep, you visualise that you're in a lift. And first of all, you can decorate the lift however you like. So sometimes I go for quite a sort of aluminium um, modern look. And other times it's got a comfy armchair and uh, and a very nice uh, lamp. (laughs) That's the word I'm thinking of. With dingly danglies around the, the outside of the lamp. And it depends. I can normally it's just me in the lift. I haven't shared a lift with anyone else. And so I decorate the lift in my mind. I get into the lift and then I press the button. The crucial thing is you go down. So you've come into the lift at sort of a top floor and you're going down. I haven't tried it going up. That may wake you up even more. Who knows? So you press the button to go down and you can just feel the motion of the lift descending very slowly, this isn't a race, it's not an Alton Towers ride, but descending very slowly, sort of floor by floor. Try it. If you know, if this works, I could write a book about this, couldn't I? So try it and please let me know, does the lift sequence work for you? Um, I find, yeah, I find the comfier the environment I build in the lift, the, the easier it is to get to sleep. The minimalist approach doesn't always work, but it depends what works for you. Just have a go. You can put some bookshelves in there, anything. It's quite it's quite a small lift, but it's not so small that you feel all, oh, gosh, can't breathe. Anyway, there we go. There's my lift chat for the day. We have got some books. We've got some really, really good books. Let me tell you what we've got. We have got today The Botanist by M. W. Craven. We've got The Guilty Couple by C. L. Taylor. Uh, Maybe I Don't Belong Here by David Harewood. Yinka, Where Is Your Husband by Lizzie Damilola Blackburn. And The Other People by C. J. Tudor. All of them are wins in different ways, but they're all wins. And I can't wait to talk to you about them. Before we get on, I must just say huge thanks to Blue Dream 60 for your review. A quick book review. Uh, And they say, I love this podcast. I found so many books to read and enjoy that I never would have without her reviews. Thank you so much, Blue Dream 60. That means so much to me. Thank you. These reviews do help ginormously. There you go. Anyway, enough about that. Let's get started. So the first book is, and I'm lifting it to the top of the pile, The Botanist by M.W. Craven. Now, this is number five in the crime series with Tilly and Poe. Listen to this blurb. Detective Sergeant Washington Poe can count on one hand the number of friends he has, but he'd still have his thumb left. There's the guilelessly innocent civilian analyst, Tilly Bradshaw, of course, insanely brilliant. She's a bit of a social hand grenade. He's known his beleaguered boss, Detective Inspector Stephanie Flynn, for years, as he has his nearest neighbour, full-time shepherd, part-time dog sitter, Victoria. And then there's Estelle Doyle, dark and dangerous and sexy as hell. It's true the caustic pathologist has never walked down the sunny side of the street, but has she gone too far this time? Shot twice in the head, her father's murder appears to be an open and shut case. Estelle has firearms discharge residue on her hands and in a house surrounded by fresh snow. Hers are the only footprints. Since her arrest, she's only said three words. Tell Washington Poe. Meanwhile, a poisoner called the botanist is sending the nation's most reviled people poems and press flowers. Twisted and ingenious, he seems to be able to walk through walls and despite the advance notice given to his victims and regardless of the security measures taken, he is able to kill with impunity. Poe hates lock room mysteries and now he has two to solve. To unravel them, 
he's going to have to draw on every resource he has. Tilly Bradshaw, an organised crime boss, even an alcoholic ex-journalist. Because if he doesn't, the bodies are going to keep piling up. There we go. Now let's go to... Uh, do I do chapter one? Uh, no, I'm going to do chapter two. This is based in a television studio in London. The lights were set to run hot. The interview was running hotter, too hot, far hotter than had been anticipated. It's too controversial, the studio owner had said all those weeks ago. I prefer provocative, the director, a woman called Justine Webb, had replied. We'll get hundreds, maybe thousands of complaints. It'll be a rating smash. I'm not sure. Yeah, these books, they're just incredible and they get better and better. I love this one. I couldn't work out how it was going to be resolved. I just knew I had faith in Tilly and Poe and that they were going to smash it. And yeah, Mike Craven's just at the top of his game. Bestseller again for this. Awesome. Anyway, enough about me. You know I love it. Read these books. Just do. <laughs> if you like crime, if you don't like crime, they're great. Great, great crimes to solve and great characters really, you know, leading the crime market on this. Anyway, enough about me. Let's talk to Mike now. M.W. Craven, whose latest fabulous book is The Botanist. Welcome back. Hello. Well, let's start with the basics. OK, so this is part of a series and you can read it in any order if you want, but... Do you prefer people to start at the beginning so they really get to know the characters or are you happy wherever they drop in? It's, I mean, it's an interesting question, that, because every book should be written so that you can read it as a standalone, so you can just pick up the series at the new book. And obviously that's what you want, because that's how series grow, by picking up new readers at, at the first book. But also, you want your characters to develop. And therefore, there'll be some developments in... In the botanist, for example, that you might not understand the nuances of if you haven't been following the series from the start. So it's a it's a tricky rope to walk, actually. And it, it's funny, actually, because the, the, the old books, the backlist, always get a bump when there's a new book out. So people obviously do think that. They'll buy the new one because they like the sound of it. And then they'll think, actually, I, I want to start this series at the beginning. So the puppet show, actually, without any promotion on it whatsoever, when the botanist was out, went to number one in, in some of the Amazon charts it was it was it was hovering around about 100 on the, on the kindle thing so it, it does i mean re readers tend to like to read books in in, in series as i do but uh, it's not absolutely essential in, in in any of them really and some of them are written like the cutting season which was out earlier this year was a complete standalone you could put it anywhere in the series really uh, you are very forgiving i think you do explain some of the history of the characters a, a little bit in each book so you can read it on its own but equally as you said I think to really get the character and the humour in particular it it does help if you've gone to the beginning and read through. Yeah I, I mean one of the I, I suppose not not problems I mean just challenges for each book is describing Tilly in particular I mean Poe you sort of get because you just work him out fairly early he's just a bad tempered so and so Tilly need the readers need new readers need a little bit of help, and that's one of the challenges is describing Tilly in an elegant way that isn't repetitive to existing readers, um, but explains it explains her character and her background and why she is how she is to to new readers. Every everyone else you can sort of pick up um, as as the story goes on because nobody's displaying extreme traits. Um, apart from Bugger Rumble, the the street performing tramp who is back in the next Poe book, the uh, next year's Poe book. Um, so I, I will have to explain, every time he comes back in, I'll have to explain who this nutter is. <laughs> well, this is, the botanist is book five for Poe and Tilly. And they, for me, they are the most memorable duo because if you, as you've just said, they are two extremes and yet their similarity is loyalty to friends. And, and that's what, brings them together and you, even using examples like food to show the differences it they're just a joyful pair. I wanted to um explore a friendship from the from the from the start which is why Poe and Tilly hadn't met each other um at the start of the puppet show and they didn't like each other to, to, to start with so the 
origins of their friendship was was a fun was a fun way, and now and then there was a bit where Tilly very much relied on Poe to help her guide guide her through the world, and obviously Tilly was helping Poe and had his back almost from about about fifty pages into the puppet show. But now, sort of, um, particularly the book I've just written, actually, uh, the Mercy Chair, which is the one after Poe's explaining their relationship to Tilly after someone says you're very protective of her. And he says, you got this the wrong way around. She's now protective of me. I mean, I rely on her more than she relies on, on me. So it's, it's, it's flipped full, full circle. But um, she'll always be Tilly. She'll always mm. be saying like, the extreme things. <laughs> yes, um, I hope she does. Which is, um, yeah. I mean, there's a bit in the next book where she asks somebody, a, a woman actually, who, who has hairs on her chin, if she has werewolf syndrome. Um, <laughs> which, is a, which, is a, which is a real thing, actually. But, you know, Tilly, because she, she's... She's not being cruel or funny. She she just generally want, wants to know, um, and because she's a scientist, if you want to know something, you you ask the question, don't you? You 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 you, you, you find out a way of finding the answers that you want. Um, I was I was thinking yesterday if I was in a situation and I could only choose one, Tilly or Poe, who would I want in my corner? And you know I couldn't choose because they've both got such incredible strengths in so very different ways. Yeah, I mean, they're symbiotic, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, Poe wouldn't be anywhere near as effective. Although he was still a very c- good cop mm. before he met Tilly. Um, he was still hunting down uh, serial killers and, and the such like. Um, I, I think, I, 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 I don't know, I, I think if I had been, say I was in Estelle Doyle's position, I'd been arrested for a murder that I may or may not have committed, um, as is the case in the bottom of this. I'd probably want Poe. Mm. On my side, because he'll just run through walls. Yes. Um, and he's the type of person who ca- who can run through walls, whereas Tilly is more. Um, she'll ad- adhere to the rules a bit more, and she worries when Poe doesn't, or when Poe says things that um, she sort of frets when he's like having an argument with someone, because she doesn't want him to get into trouble. Um, it, it, it's fun, but yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And yet, she's able. To, she doesn't want to flout the rules sort of face to face and yet any IT rules she manages to find a workaround. Uh, yeah, they don't, they, IT rules don't apply to her, do they? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a weird contradiction actually and I'm very, it's one I'm very aware of that she does like to obey the law except when it comes to hacking in. I mean, hacking isn't the right word, actually, because um, I know hackers don't like the word hacking. Um, and she sort of breaches the security of yeah. various <laughs> um, various uh, databases and, and firewalls with that with with apparent ease. Yes. She does it without even without even thinking. And because she doesn't think she's really doing anything wrong, Poe has to actually shut her up from time to time. Otherwise, she's going to get herself into trouble by blurting out how she's found something. <laughs> and in The Botanist, their latest case that we read about, there are two separate murders, sort of locked room mysteries. Was that something you'd been wanting to write for them? It, it was. I, I set myself a challenge with each with each book. I want to do a theme. Because if I, if I do that, then I know the, each book is going to be different to the last. So... Um, for, for for Black Summer, for example, I wanted to give an impossible puzzle for Tilly to solve. Um, I didn't want her to just sort of be able to just whiz away through any any problem. Um, so I give her the how can somebody be both dead and alive at the same time problem. In the creator, I wanted to give a warning shot. So I wanted to hurt somebody, and um, just so just so you were, you, were, you you were never convinced everyone was going to make it to the end of the book. Um, but this one I wanted to do a lot room mystery, uh, which I had done in a couple of short stories, and I really enjoyed it. The challenge and seeing if I could do something that hadn't been done before, that type of thing. Um, I, I, I don't think it's really possible to do something that hasn't been done before. You can do different variations of, of something because there's a lot of locked room mysteries out there. So most things have been covered. So, yeah, it was intentional. I, did, I didn't intend to do two, actually. That's just the way it sort of panned out because um, I, I had just planned it to be a uh, pure botanist story, but that was going to just be a bit one-paced, I thought. So I added... Um, a little subplot, which then, after a, a bit of tweaking of the plot, became a sort of um, a co-story, if you mean. So there was two separate strands running, which was fun. Which was a which 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 was fun actually because it meant because Flynn, who's who's Poe's boss, Poe and Tilly's boss, was one hundred percent focused on the botanist case because that's what they were hired to do. Mm. That's, that's their job. 
whereas Poe um, was on a flyer, really. He had no role in the Estelle Doyle um, investigation at all. So she was a lot of fun to write. The way she was getting exasperated by Poe, just basically not fully focused on, <laughs> on, on the botanist and, and his split loyalties. And therefore, Tilly's loyalties are always going to be with Poe. So she was getting dragged away from the botanist investigation. So that was that was fun as well. And it worked It worked quite, quite well in the end. It was... Um, the way I was able to dart back and forwards um, up and down the country. Yes, and there might be other lot room mysteries, but there's never a Poe and Tilly a lot room mystery, so there's you know never anything like it. No, the, and, and there's nothing like I mean like um, Poe and Tilly trying to work out what the code might be on a keypad, that yeah. type of thing. So they just have all these wild guesses, and it's just you know, it just like, things that you can have a lot of fun with. Just bits where they're a bit about stumped, and they're just like waffling to each other because someone was saying to me the other day that my dialogue that it's quite realistic and the, the reason for that is I don't I, I ignore the creative writing rule of dialogue should push plot or um, character forward because I think if you do that then the, it becomes quite wooden and mm. so for example before we came before this started, we were just talking about tattoos. It was nothing to do with... Um, that's what people do when they've got a bit of time to kill. They talk about whatever happens to float in, in, in the mind. So I tend to do that, which is why you get all these little... Till you explain the rules of muggle, muggle quidditch to pose. It's got nothing to do with... Um, yeah. plot, a little bit to do with character, but by then you know the characters anyway. So that's why I think people sort of... And they probably don't realise, but they, they said the dialogue feels real. That's because real dialogue has pockets of absolute nonsense in between the stuff that actually people want to talk about. And yet it is still driving the character because those little lovely details just reinforce the the Poe and Tilly that we love. Yeah, and sometimes I have to take things out um, because we're, we've had a bit too much of that and we do need to actually get the plot moving forward. So that, that actually scene with the Muggle Quidditch, actually, which was in Dead Ground, had been in two books before, before I actually finally made it. Because I was asked if there was a blooper reel uh, of Poe and Tilly stuff, and there is, but I'm not going to share it because I, 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 I go into it every now and then when I need something. I thought, well, actually, that scene, I've been wanting to do that. There's a scene where um, Poe drops some toast and it lands butter side down and he says, typical, and then um, it's bad luck, that type of thing. And Tilly explains why it's actually physics, not bad luck, and she <laughs> does the maths for him. Um, and that, that had been cut from at least two books, and finally I got it in a, in a short story. But it was, um, it's little things like that where they're just talking to each other about nothing. Um, and, so, and sometimes you think that Poe hasn't got a clue what she's talking about. And other times Tilly hasn't got a clue what, what she's talking about. Or the thing about food is a, is a good example of this just waffling on about, about nothing and gently teasing each other. And I'm interested in the balance of obviously the serious, the crime element and the humour, because your book, you know, I do, I laugh out loud at, at parts of them because they are so funny. Is it quite hard getting the right balance so it doesn't become a comedy? I, I don't struggle with it too much. Occasionally I, I might be asked to just take something out, um, but usually I can sort of judge it for myself. Not, that, not, not when I'm writing the first time, it's when I'm going through normally on the third or fourth draft when I'm just tidying things up and I'll, I'll realise actually this is probably a bit misplaced this so th there is a time sometimes i use it as a circuit breaker a bit of um humor um inappropriate humor in a in a in a in a place you're not expecting it just to snap you back out of something quite dark um i i tend to put a lot of humor in at the start when i'm introducing the characters um hence at the start of the botanist tilly and poe are on a stakeout and tilly's been in charge of the food um, which poe's absolutely furious about so that type of thing um but I'm very much sort of influenced by Terry Pratchett in that regard. So the Terry Pratchett books are very, very funny. But in, cert in certain parts of each book, there's a, there's a bit where humour wouldn't be appropriate. So my favourite book, uh, Night Watch by Terry Pratchett, humour all the way through. But there's parts where they um, break into some dungeons, or a police station actually, and they go into the cells and they see... Um, like dead people and dying people who are, who have been tortured, so that would clearly not be a place where Terry Pratchett would put humour, and he and he, and he didn't because he was he was the master. So I very much take my guidance from that. There's a there's a time and place, um, and you you sort of naturally come to know it, um, and that very I, 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 this 
when, when people ask me, can you learn how to write? Of course you can. It's, it's a skill like anything else. But you can't teach someone to have a sense of humour. And you can't teach someone to have an imagination. So the two things, if you haven't got those two things in your in your personality, then I'm not saying you can't be a writer, but you're never going to be a comedy writer. Or you're never, you're never going to be writing that. You're never going to be writing about Lord of, like Narnia or um, Middle Earth because you have to yeah. be able, you have to be able to imagine, imagine these things. And let's talk about the the botanist in in this book, the the murderer, such a such a twisted person. I mean, have you met a lot of twisted people to be able to come up with characters like this? I, I mean, I was a probation officer for sixteen years, and I, I never met any of the cartoonish, almost cartoonish villains that I tend to write about um it was, it was fun to write because i mean I, I suppose looking back in the series he's probably my first out and out serial killer i i know that i i know the puppet show had a had um looked like it was a serial killer story but it it, it wasn't really um and the curator had a lot of dead bodies in it but that was another sort of means to an end type thing whereas this one is just an out and out um so you can you can imagine the puppet show and the curator, um, if their if the killer's um, plan had happened, then the killings would have stopped. It he would have just come to a natural he or she would have come to mm. a natural end, whereas this guy would have just carried on going. Yeah. In and in from Um because that's what he was doing. He was he was he was killing people. Um, and we have enough reviled public figures in this country. There was a big pot of potential victims and because nobody knew how he was doing it he could have just carried on forever and i do find it interesting the sort of social commentary that comes across in the book it, it it feels like it gives you the space to to make those observations and what sort of uh going wrong in the world yeah i mean there was uh, i mean it was a little it was cathartic in some ways in that you could have a go at people that like you I just really annoyed you in 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 in, in them uh, on TV or on on Twitter particularly, but also it was it was interesting because I I was sort of thinking right if this actually was happening how would the public react to someone killing these people who most people um, actually despise. Uh, now there's not a Piers Morgan character in this, so I can talk about him. But I was imagining if. If someone had a death threat for Piers Morgan and he was generally going to, how many people would be terribly upset? Piers Morgan's family, obviously, and his friends and his supporters would be, but there'll be a, a fair percentage of the population who would actually re rejoice. And the people I'm talking about are far worse than Piers Morgan with some of the things that they've done to become a, a potential victim of the of the botanist. So the fact I put like people were getting botanist t-shirts and um, as fast as the police could take them down off Amazon, new ones were coming back up and um, he was trending on Twitter and all, all this and so on social media and stuff. I thought that's probably a very real response to what would have, um, what would have happened. I mean, I, I honestly thought that's, which, which is, which sort of tells you a little bit about where we are as a society at the minute in, in that he was, cheering on a serial killer basically i would like to think our the public would be a little bit more restrained but i suspect they wouldn't be so do you get your notepad out and make these notes when someone wants you up i mean if we see you uh, in real life we're writing something down and we say back away quick <laughs> <laughs> there's some, something bad being noted here uh, no, I mean I don't have a list or anything, but there, there was a couple of things that I'd, that I'd read in the in the in the paper that had, um, I mean, we, without being a spo this isn't a spoiler. It's it's the first victim, and he's in the first chapter. Um, the I, I was reading an article about incels and about how they made someone's life an absolute misery. Um, the involuntary celibate movement. Um, well, it's not really a movement, is it? Just a bunch of idiots, really. A bunch of sad, sad, just sad men. Um, who can't understand why women don't want to um, be with them. And their behaviour is the reason they nobody wants to be with them. So, yeah, so I was reading about that. And then I read a book by, I think it was Helene Keast, which had also mentioned them. I, don't, I was already writing it by then, but that sort of um, gave me the female perspective of... Um, female of the, A female author's perspective of, um, of what the incel movement sort of means. 
So I, I was able to sort of, and I actually changed the host when I, when I read um, some more articles written by by females on on the incels. Um, it, it's funny actually this one because I'm part of the UK Crime Book Club on on Facebook, and for some I can't remember why I did it, but I just said, look, anyone who wants to be in the botanist, just put your name in the comments. And there was about seven hundred people wanted to be, and I said, these are the type of people I'm, I'm looking for. I'm looking for a racist. I'm looking for this. I'm looking for that. I'm looking for that. Um, not volunteers. It, it was it was it was truly shocking. So there's a lot of like names of people that um, either volunteer to be in this book or people I know. Uh, it's uh, I've got a weird mental block actually when it comes to um, just naming just ordinary people. I can't do it. It takes me far longer to do it than it should. I end up looking through phone books just to get a name that doesn't sound like any other names, but it's normal. When you've got seven hundred names, well, exactly, you know, exactly. It, it, it was um, it was a little gold mine. It was. Let's talk about the conundrums because we face these mind bending conundrums uh, with very believable solutions. I hasten to add. At what point do you know the answers when you've come up with the conundrum, or is your journey of writing exploring how that works as well? I had the solution to the botanist before I went in. So I was able to work that in from the from the very start. So I was able to drop the clues. Because I always want to help. I always want to give readers a chance to solve it before Poe does. Because I think that's that's fun, isn't it? It's fun for readers. And I think with varying, with varying degrees of success, people manage it in the books. So a lot of people get um, got the killer in the puppet show. Hardly anyone got Black Summer and, and, and various things like that. So yeah, I had that. I didn't have the solution to um, the Estelle Doyle one until fairly late until fairly late on, uh, which was, um, I, ha I had how she had been set up, but I didn't, I didn't have a key aspect to it. I wasn't worried. I mean, I, 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 I've just got this weird, weird little lucky thing that goes on when I always think of something and it works perfectly and it tends to fit in with everything else. At one point, it's not going to happen. I'm going to be absolutely, I'm going to have written a book that actually makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> I'm sure not. Can you turn Tilly and Poe off in your head when you're not writing? Uh, well, I've had to because I'm writing a new series at the minute uh, with a brand new protagonist. Uh, I'm on the second book in, in that series. It, it's a COVID story, this, actually. When, during the first lockdown, my editor emailed me to say, have you got anything, have you written anything I haven't read because I've got nothing. No, editors, uh, sorry, agents aren't sending me anything at the minute. So I'd written this story in 2015. When I start work, I just wrote it in my lunch times. Uh, in between the first flute book and the second flute book, just to see if I could write something in the uh, first person. So I sent her this um, thriller set in America, which she bought and she put, she tagged it onto the botanist and mercy chair contract. But then uh, the um, Flatline Books in America, um, part of Panmark, one of the big publishing houses, bought it. And they wanted it to be, it was just, I, I, I read it as a load of nonsense, never expecting anyone to see it. Um, and Little Brown bought it as the as a standalone, but then the Americans wanted it as the first in a series. So I had to, I've, I spent four months rewriting it so it would work as a series, and I'm about halfway through the second one now. Um, so that'll be next year's book. I think there'll still be a Poe book next year, but it won't be till the back end of the year. I think next year's summer book will probably be the first in the new series. I think uh, I'm a bit out of the loop on this because um, the my editor in the UK and in the US are liaising with each other to make sure they get it released on the same day that, that so they can like combine marketing and all that nonsense but um, so yeah I ha I've had to switch them off basically because I'm, I'm writing it in a slightly different style uh, which is interesting it's a challenge but sometimes when I'm writing the Ben Conan book I'm itching to get back to the next post story just because the next post story in my head is always the best always the best one um, but at the minute I'm writing about an American who just goes around thumping people all the time. Oh, so, um, so I mean, there'll be a few to Poe and Tilly fans who won't like it because it's not Poe and Tilly. I mean, and that's I I, I accept that, but it'll 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 widen my readership yeah. to people who wouldn't read police procedurals but do read action thrillers. Um, and then hopefully they'll they'll think well like I'll see what else he's he's done. The the question that you I'm sure you get fed up of being asked, but there was some talk of it a, a while ago. TV series is that still moving or not? Yeah, I've just been given the rights back. Actually, uh, it was, it was. I mean, it was about as close as you can get from being commissioned by the BBC. Actually, we had a script. The um, it had been 
the, the way that the BBC do things, they um, they sort of put a champion into one of the regional developers. I had the guy who was in charge of BBC Northern Ireland. He was championing it. He did a lot of work on the script. Um, then he sent he sent it up to the head man for drama, a fellow called Piers, and he's the one who says yes or no. He asked for some more development between Poe and his father, actually, which they didn't really have a, a blueprint for because I hadn't done that. They haven't done that yet, actually, and I'm six books in. And and then uh, COVID happened, and the commission every all the all commissioning shut down because obviously there was no, no nothing was being filmed. And during COVID, the Black Lives Matter movement started and the commissioning landscape changed slightly. So um, they they passed in the end, which was, I, I think, a blessing in disguise because I wasn't particularly happy with the with the script. It was written by um, a young lad from London. It, it, I mean, it was, it was a very good script, but he only had the puppet show to go on. He didn't have the sort of the, the body of work that there is now. So he had made assumptions that were, were wrong. So he had um, a sort of um, will they, won't they thing between Flynn and Poe, which obviously in the books is, is would never happen because Flynn's a, um, gay and she's in a long-term relationship. She had Tilly as sort of been a bit of um, uh, infatuated with, with with men and she's like, uh, as in a bit sex crazed, weird, weirdly, which wouldn't, wouldn't work. I mean, at some point I will give Tilly a boyfriend just because I think it'll be funny, <laughs> but uh, not the way he had written it. And they also had weird views on what we do in the north, which uh, the very first scene that you see Poe in the, in the script, he was having a bath outside, like a tin bath outside. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. Uh, right. So I was, um, I, I, I know David's been talking to a few studios recently, but uh, we the books are doing well enough that we don't have to take the first offer that we that we take now we, we did at the time actually because it was 2017 and we we're a bit skint because I hadn't I'd left probation in 2015 so I was basically living off my savings until the um we had the puppet show contract through but it wasn't a massive advance for the first couple of books because I was I was I was an unknown obviously um I mean we're getting good advances now obviously but the uh so we're a bit popular so when the uh, studio Lambert came along and offered a five figure sum for an eighty month option. I was like, yes, I take it. Just whatever, whatever you say. Uh, but but now we 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 were in a position where we can just say just yes to the right person rather than just yes to anyone. And and no to tin bars. No tin baths. We don't want tin bars. That that doesn't work. Well, I can't wait to read the Mercy Chair next. But everyone needs to be reading the Botanist as quickly as possible. M W Craven, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And the next book is The Guilty Couple by C.L. Taylor. Now, I was reading this in the queue at the Hay Festival for an event. I had to queue. Uh, well, you don't need to queue at all. But of course, me, I want to be on the front seat for all the actors that do Letters Live. So you are queuing for over an hour. And I thought, will this book help me? Will it keep me gripped? And it did to the point where somebody said, what's that you're reading? You're completely immersed in it. And I was like, yes, it's The Guilty Couple. And it's rather good. Listen to this blurb. Five years ago, Olivia Sutherland was wrongfully convicted of plotting to murder. Now she's finally free. Olivia has three goals. Repair her relationship with her daughter, clear her name and bring down her husband, the man who framed her. Just how far is she willing to go to get what she wants and how far will he go to stop her? Because his lies run deeper than Olivia could ever have imagined and this time it's not just her freedom that's in jeopardy but her life. And let's do first sentences. Olivia, 2014. Only one member of the jury glances in my direction as they file back into the room. She's early 40s with long dark hair and a soft round face. She looks like a Sarah or a Helen and her heavy gaze has rested on me for the last five days. We're around the same age and I hope that's made her sympathetic towards me. There but for the grace of God go I and all that. Or maybe she believes that I'm the monster the prosecutor has painted me out to be. A liar and a cheat, a woman riddled with hatred and obsessed with money and death. Honestly, this is another great book. And this is definitely C.L. Taylor's best as far as I'm concerned. 
I really liked it. It's a little different to some of her others. It's gripping. It's, yeah, you're just reading it to find out what happens. Loved, loved, loved it. And we've got Seal Taylor. Callie Taylor is joining us to answer the five questions in five minutes. So C.L. Taylor, known to us as Callie Taylor, the wonderful Callie Taylor, whose latest astonishing, brilliant book. I think I'm giving away what I think about it, but the great book is called The Guilty Couple. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me back. Well, had to. Wonderful, wonderful book. But your first question, can you describe your book in 30 seconds? OK, have you got a timer going? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll do my best to do a very speedy um, um, summary. So The Guilty Couple, couple is about a woman called Olivia, who is a wife and a mother and a gallery owner. And she has a very normal life until her husband frames her for a crime that she didn't commit. She spends five years in prison. Then she comes out and with her thief cellmate, Smithy, sets out to regain custody of her daughter, um, prove her innocence and get revenge on her ex-husband and the female bent cop who helped set her up. Mm, <laughs> yes. Oh, it just makes me want to read it again. <laughs> The next question is, who is your favourite character? But it has to be one of the smaller one. It can't be Olivia and her dastardly husband, ex-husband. <laughs> it is most definitely Smithy. <laughs> Smithy is Olivia's uh, cellmate um, and she is a sort of East London girl and she's a thief, a pickpocket. Um, she's fascinated with a book by Harry Houdini, which, as well as talking about his magician tricks, also has stuff on scams on it and um, and that sort of thing. And Smithy is just like a little breath of funny, fresh air. Um, so whenever I had to write her, it just made me smile. And um, yeah, she's she's definitely a good sidekick. Yeah, she's a real human character. There's so much to her, even though she's a smaller one. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot going on there. Indeed, yes. We won't give any games <laughs> away, but yes. Can you describe your book using just three words? Woman Seeks Revenge. Oh, look at you. Just coming <laughs> off with those. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've had your Weetabix today. <laughs> I had good coffee. <laughs> yeah. Well, the next question is about this. What food and drink did you consume when you were writing this particular book? Oh, um, I will have drunk most definitely a lot of Diet Coke. Um, I have <laughs> I have a little bit of a Diet Coke habit. Um, food wise, probably um, toast, cheese, crisps. <laughs> <laughs> do you have to clean your keyboard then when you finish the book <laughs> sometimes yes <laughs> i also have tons and tons of uh as well as as well as empty diet coke cans i also have lots of pint glasses because i like a, a pint of squash as well so when i'm really busy there can be plates with crumbs and glass oh it's just awful slovenly <laughs> 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 I was interested though because this book is quite different I think it is quite different to your other books I mean I think it's your best one yet I really do and I was wondering if you were fueled by anything different to your other books all of which are absolutely super books but w was there anything different yeah I wanted to do something a bit different this time because in all the other books it's you know something awful happens to a woman and she she tries to sort of work out what's going on why why is this happening who is behind it and I thought it was about time for a change so in this one the bad things already happened she's already been framed um, and the book actually opens in in the court case um, and and I wanted the woman to be, Olivia, to be more active. Um, so in a lot of psychological thrillers, including a lot that I've written, the women are quite reactive. So awful things happen and they try and, and figure it out. Mm. This one, Olivia has a very definite goal. Prove her innocence, get her revenge. And I wanted it to be more action-led than my previous books. Um, and I love a heist movie. So... There, there is a heist um, sort of in the middle of the book, but it's a heist for evidence, to snatch back evidence. 
and I just I just loved writing something pacier, something with more going on and with a more active mm. heroine. Awesome. The last question, what's been your most memorable moment so far in your writing career? Oh, my gosh, there's been so many. Um, I mean, that sounds mm-hmm. that sounds braggy, but um, <laughs> I've been writing. No, I've been no pub- not at all. I've been published since 2009. <laughs> oh, it's so hard to choose. I'm torn between meeting Richard and Judy, which was a massive ambition um, when sleep was part of the um, Rich and Judy book club um, being on stage at the Nielsen Book Awards to to get an award for 250,000 copies sold of The Accident and the Lie that was such a sparkly starry (laughs) event I've never been to anything like it and um, going to Dudley um, for an award show for The Island my young adult book and being swarmed, surrounded by kids who were just so excited about my book and wanted to get it signed. That that event with the kids left me buzzing more than anything else, I think. I was on a high for the rest of the day. Oh, that's wonderful. I mean, I love the combination of all three, yeah. but that's, that's <laughs> incredible. That's wonderful. Well, C.L. Yeah. Taylor, whose latest book is The Guilty Couple, thank you so very much. Thank you very much for having me. And the next book, Maybe I Don't Belong Here by David Harewood. Now, I'd seen David talking to Stephen Fry at the Hay Festival. Sorry, I'm going to stop talking about the Hay Festival eventually. But this was great. A memoir of race, identity, breakdown and recovery. Is it possible to be black and British and feel welcome and whole? In this powerful and provocative account of a life lived after psychosis, critically acclaimed actor David Harewood uncovers devastating family history and investigates the very real impact of racism on black mental health. When David Harewood was 23, his acting career started to take off. He had what he now understands to be a psychotic breakdown and was sectioned under the Mental Health Act. He was physically restrained by six police officers, sedated, then hospitalised and transferred to a locked ward. Only now, 30 years later, has he been able to process what he went through. What was it that caused this breakdown and how did David recover to become a successful actor? How does his experiences growing up black and British contribute to a rupture in his sense of place in the world? Maybe I Don't Belong Here is a deeply personal exploration of the duality of growing up both black and British, recovering from crisis and a rallying cry to examine the systems and biases that continue to shape our society. Uh, Let's go for this. A letter to the reader. First of all, I have to be honest, this is not what you might call a straight up autobiography. If you're looking for tales of the high life, of the glam and the glitter, this book probably isn't for you. The shops are full of fluffy celebrity exposés charting the drama of fame and fortune. And if that's what you're expecting, you might want to ask for your money back. It's an extraordinary book. Yes, it's honest and thought provoking, but it's something that you have to read. It gives you a gave me a much better understanding of the racism that David's had to face, how why he is who he is now and how these mental issues, challenges have shaped him to be the person that he is. I learnt a lot more about racism about mental health about him as an actor and him as a car- as a person a uh, brilliant read obviously it's non-fiction um all sorts of triggers but it's a book to read crikey it's a book to read and understand so yeah just phenomenal and i'm just putting it over there excellent right the next two books we're going to go through very quickly because i say i'm the quick book reviews and i'm not doing quick book reviews yinka where is your husband by lizzie damilola blackburn i loved it um i read it on the kindle okay here's the blurb yinka wants to find love her mum wants to find it for her but how can she find a husband when she's surrounded by her many aunties who frequently and loudly pray for her delivery from singledom has a preference for chicken and chips over traditional nigerian food and her bum she sure is far too small as a result Oh, and the fact that she's a 31-year-old South Londoner who doesn't believe in sex before marriage is a bit of an obstacle too. When her cousin gets engaged, Yimma, Yimma, sorry, oh, Philippa. When her cousin gets engaged, Yinka commences Operation Find a Date for Rachel's Wedding. 
armed with a totally flawless and incredibly specific plan, will Yinka find herself a husband? What if the thing she really needs to find is herself? Right, let's get that first sentence for you. January, the prayer of the century. It's two hours into my sister's baby shower and so far not one person has said, so Yinka, when is it going to be your turn? Or the classic, Yinka, where is your husband? Thank you, God. And I love how husband is spelt with a Z. Um, if you can listen to the audio book of this, do, because it's glorious with the um, accents that just make this book even more special. I loved it. It's it's not a crime. It's not a thriller. It's a bit of fun, but it's also sad. And it just, again, makes you think it's lovely. It's a lovely read. Really enjoyed it. Excellent. And the other one, The Other People by C.J. Tudor. I listened to this on audiobook and it's the first book in ages that I have been able to focus on, hear it all, you know, not drift off, enjoy it. I'm going to really get back into C.J. Tudor. I don't know if it's all the stuff that I'm dealing with at home with poorly child is making me search out the darker side of books to read which is a little bit concerning anyway we'll uh we'll uh immediately speed down a psychologist about that one or maybe we won't anyway cj tudor in the past i had read one of her books which i really enjoyed but it always felt a bit too dark for me whereas now i'm like bring it on bring it on let's read it let's hear it and uh, OK, let's go for the blurb of this. Um, driving home one night, Gabe sees the face of a little girl he knows in the rear window of the car in front. She mouths one word, Daddy. It's his five-year-old daughter, Izzy. He never sees her again. The police believe she's dead. But three years later, Gabe still drives the road, searching for the car that took Izzy, never giving up hope. Meanwhile, Fran and her daughter, Alice, aren't searching, but running always one step ahead of the people who want to hurt them because Fran knows the truth about Gabe's daughter and she knows what the people chasing her will do if they ever catch them. Yeah, it's it's that good. It really is. Now, can I actually extract the first sentence seeing as I did it with the audio book? Yes, I can. Let's get that for you now. Monday, April the 11th, 2016, M1 North. He noticed the stickers first, surrounding the car's rear window and lining the bumper. Honk if you're horny. Don't follow me, I'm lost. When you drive like I do, you'd better believe in God. Horn broken, watch for finger. Real men love Jesus. Talk about mixed messages, although one thing did come through loud and clear. The driver was a dick. Gabe was willing to bet he wore slogan t-shirts and had a picture at work of a monkey with its hands over its head and the caption, you don't have to be mad to work here, but it helps. Quite simply, as I say, I really, really enjoyed this book. It kept me captivated and motivated. I've already downloaded another of her books to listen to. I'm going to get into this. Who knows? Maybe I will read a Stephen King next. It's nothing like a Stephen King book, so don't worry about that. But I just feel I'm going down a path and who knows where it's going to end. But yeah, great. All five books, great. So this week... We have reviewed, or I have reviewed, The Botanist by M.W. Craven and Mike very kindly came on to talk to us. Then we had The Guilty Couple with C.L. Taylor and Callie very kindly did the five questions in five minutes. I reviewed Maybe I Don't Belong Here by David Harewood, uh, Yinka Where Is Your Husband by Lizzie, Damilola Blackburn and The Other People by C.J. Tudor. Love them all. And, oh my goodness, some great books to talk to you about next week, as you would expect. So look after after yourselves and I'll see you very soon. Take care now. You've Bye-bye. been listening to the Quick Book Reviews podcast. That's enough books, said no one, ever. See you again soon.